thank you, Matheson. That will indeed be all. We really must get started. <clears throat> Apologies, ladies, gentlemen, that our hospitality tonight has not been what it ought to have been. You must forgive me. I have been rushed off my feet this past week. As you will be no doubt aware, much has changed since last we spoke, and precious little of it for the better, I'm afraid. Perhaps the greatest blow was the assassination of President Roosevelt last week. With him died any real hope we had of the United States joining the war in anger, at least so long as the Axis don't do anything stupid to provoke them. Most will rightly recognise this as a crime perpetrated by the isolationist lobby, but the outrage against this tragedy seems unlikely to translate into support for joining the war. The silver lining, if one is to be found, is that it seems that the late President's wishes regarding Lend Lease will still be honoured, so long as the Royal Navy can protect the convoys. So, while we must fight on alone, we will not be short of the material to fight with, at least for the time being. That's about the extent of the good news, though, I'm afraid. News of Roosevelt's assassination seems to have caused Hitler to redouble his intention to remove the last thorn in the side of his new empire, and that would be us. To be frank, the government never honestly believed he would follow through with an invasion of the British Isles. We had high hopes that his ambitions truly lay to the east with the Soviets. That is not to say that our efforts and preparation were in vain, however. On the contrary, the British Isles are a natural fortress, and the sea is our moat. Invading her is surely a daunting task, so it was by adding our prepared defences on top of our God-given ones that we became confident that the Hun might, in actual fact, be deterred at last. But it seems now, with our strongest potential ally in mourning and robbed of her leader, Hitler has decided to secure his Western Front once and for all, before the forces of democracy can be rallied against him. The amassing of an invasion force in Normandy has been stepped up, and our aerial photography reveals things are already nearing completion. It seems likely that the attack will come at a high tide during a new moon, probably at the end of this month. The Luftwaffe has redoubled their assault on our airfields, with additional support from their Italian allies this week, and the Royal Air Force is, quite frankly, now on its knees. We can fix the planes, we can fix the airfields, but we cannot fix the airmen we are losing, and training them is taking too long. The Royal Navy has begun to bolster the home fleet as much as possible, without leaving the rest of the Empire vulnerable. But Admiral Raider has been single-minded in this past week in his focus on securing two sections of the channel for an invasion, which are now thick with German U-boats and naval mines. And we even believe old battleships from the Great War are being rapidly refitted to assist in covering the invasion forces. I'm afraid, then, that we have been caught out, and simply can't bring enough of our superior navy into the channel to reclaim it without risking the loss of the very ships which will ensure our survival under siege by defending our trade routes and other ports. No, we cannot rely upon the wind and the waves to defend us any longer. When the hammer of the Hun falls, it falls now to the steel of the Royal Armoured Corps and the blood and sweat of our brave soldiery to shield our women and children from him. And so too it falls to you and your draftsmen, your forges, your machine shops, and your ingenuity, esteemed ladies and gentlemen of the Teabag Committee, to equip them for their task. I have summoned you here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, to request your aid once again. As invasion looms larger than ever, we must look to increase the effective strength of our ground forces by any means available to us. Now, I give you the Vickers Medium Mark II. No, really. There are about two score of them parked on flatbeds round the back of the house as we speak, and you're all to take two each away with you tonight. I am quite literally giving you a pair of Vickers Medium Mark IIs as of this moment. These tanks were the cutting edge in the 1920s, or so we told ourselves, and there's hardly a tank man in the army today who didn't earn his stripes in one, whether they were in frontline service or as a training vehicle. But, as fond as our memories of them may be, they are soon to become a liability. A waste of good steel, guns and engines, all of which still have some serviceable life left in them to contribute to the war effort, but not while shackled to their current obsolete forms. So, I charge you and your engineers to find a way of stripping them down to their component parts and turning them into something that can actually serve their country, as more than just target practice and cannon fodder for Jerry's anti-tank guns. You have experience now of making two engines work in tandem, and I suggest that you do so again, as the engine you have to work with is an air-cooled Armstrong Sidley V8, which produces just 90 horsepower. 
Engine technology has come a long way since 1924, but there are faithful, simple motors and still good for hard work with a thorough servicing. The three-pounder gun was the gold standard in tank guns until the two-pounder was adopted to replace it. But I have had some colleagues at the War Office run a separate initiative to rush the development of a modern AP round for the old 47mm gun, and I am pleased to say that it is comparing favourably with the two-pounder in initial testing. And it still possesses a modest but useful high-explosive round to boot. In short, these engines and guns can still prove useful against the invader, but only when incorporated into a new design, fit for the modern battlefield. And that is where your brains come in, ladies and gentlemen. The War Office has drawn up a specification for a new light tank or scout tank, incorporating a pair of the old V8s and a three-pounder gun. The plan is to convert all 180 available Mark I and Mark II Vickers mediums into 90 of the new vehicle. So it will be a limited production run, which we would hope the winning company will accomplish in-house to save manufacturing capacity elsewhere. Not all of the mediums we still have have their three-pounder gun. Some were converted and some never had one in the first place. And the Mark I's have an obsolete short barrel version, which is of no use to us. So the ratio of two engines to one gun leaves pleasingly little wastage in practice. We envisage these tanks as being scout tanks, the eyes and ears of our artillery and other forces in the case of an invasion. And furthermore, a colleague of mine at the War Office has been working on plans for a large glider, which could be used to get a sufficiently light tank airborne for deployment behind enemy lines and the like. This would be a very useful means of counter-attack and distraction. On account of the weak engine and their intended airborne use then, keeping the weight down will be your highest priority, as speed and manoeuvrability will be paramount in such a design. As far as the glider is concerned, I am told you are restricted to just 8 tonnes, ladies and gentlemen, and only 2.4 metres in width. This is sure to test the abilities you have honed in the past two challenges I have set for you. Please see the following specification. All other parameters are entirely your choice, if they are not listed in the specification. Vehicles that do not meet the fixed criteria in any of the categories will be disqualified, scoring zero for that category. So please, do read the specification very carefully before you set to work. Your deadline, ladies and gentlemen, is 10 days hence, the 25th of November. Qualifying vehicles will be judged on the basis of how much they exceed the specification criteria and by testing on our proving ground. The successful bidder will have all remaining Vickers mediums, including the engines and guns from those stripped down for development by your unsuccessful competitors, transferred to them ASAP for rapid conversion. Remember, your design proposals are an essential part of the war effort. And I'm sorry to press you, but time is now very short. So you must find a way to develop a suitable design of high quality in record time. But I know that if anyone can do it, it is the delegates of this group. Good night and Godspeed, chaps. And don't forget to collect your tanks on the way out, eh?